Hi, everyone. Welcome to Lean for Product Managers. My name is Tim Mullen, and I'm a senior product manager at Amazon. Um, and I'm going to be talking about Lean today and um, how that can be implemented by product managers. I learned Lean at Toyota, uh, where I worked for six years. I was a Toyota production system instructor, and I led projects to design and deploy JIT supply chain systems and solutions for auto parts. Our focus today will be mostly on the philosophy of Lean, um, though we will talk about some technical Lean tools. We only have about 30 or so minutes, so we can't go too deep into all everything about Lean, but I, what I wanna leave you with is some key takeaways so that you'll be able to have a good understanding of what, of what Lean is all about and some practical ways to implement it. Um, so as product managers, uh, we build the vision and strategy of products to meet customer needs and project manage until release. And so our focus is on what we should build and we work with tech teams to deliver. So emphasis on the word should. So should deals a lot with philosophy, what you think about business, what you think about the way things should operate. And so as product managers, we want to make sure that we're building the right things for our customers. So what is your business philosophy? Is business an adversarial venture where each person tries to take the most value out of the other person? I hope not. Are we here to create winners and losers? I don't, as for me, that's not my intention when I, when I engage in business. Uh, one, one thing that inspired me, uh, which I read, it was from Henry Ford, and it was almost about 100 years ago when he wrote it. And Henry Ford is credited by Toyota as being the inventor of lean. And he wrote, it has been thought that business exists for profit. That is wrong. Business exists for service. So how do businesses serve? Well, businesses serve by making products that enrich the lives of others while reducing prices, lead times, and increasing quality. Businesses serve by offering good working conditions and stable employment. And they serve by giving back, by supporting the community and the environment. So what is Lean? Lean is a systematic management philosophy that enables organizations to increase the amount of value they provide to customers, leading to greater customer and employee satisfaction and business growth. So the origins of Lean come from the writings of Henry Ford. I highly encourage you to read his autobiographical book, um, one of them being My Life and Work. And uh, Toyota managers read his books and they codified his principles into the Toyota production system. And it was later read and uh, studied by professors at MIT and University of Michigan and other people in academia, and they popularized it under the name of Lean. And uh, Lean has been adopted in various forms by most industries. So the framework of Lean is really, uh, the way Toyota has codified it is under this framework here called the House of TPS. And it has several layers to it. Um, and all of these layers and components work together in concert to produce the, the, the top point of this house, which is the outcome layer. So you can see on the bottom, we have a philosophical layer, which is the things that lean values in the system. This is where we're coming from. This is why we're doing what we're doing. Respect for humanity, customer first, continuous improvement, Genba first, and stability. And I'll go into a lot of this later to kind of flesh out what these mean. The next is the methods and tools layer. How do we implement our philosophies such that we can have the outcome layer which is the peak here where we're able to produce the highest quality, lowest cost and shortest lead time products. So the methods and tools, these are, these are what get a lot of the, the play in the media of just in time processes, Kaizen, um, and then other kinds of principles that you know, we don't have time to go into today, but these are all the technical tools that people like to talk about. But most people don't really talk about the philosophies or even what are, the, what, is, what are the ideal outcomes that we're shooting for when we, when we implement Lean? So a, a key simple takeaway that I want people to, to recognize uh, or to walk away from with this presentation is in Lean, if you get the philosophies right, if you're really dedicated to the philosophies, then the tools, methods, and outcomes 
will naturally manifest over time. They will show up. Okay. And then, however, if you focus on the tools, methods, and outcomes first and get the philosophies wrong, then your ship will crash on the rocks. And I'll go into more of this later. So let's talk about respect for humanity. So respect for humanity involves teamwork, trust, partnership, understanding, and collaboration. So what are some practical applications for product managers? Because that sounds pretty basic, right? Respect for humanity. Sure, I respect people. Well, how about this? When you build your products, do you solicit input, feedback, and try to get buy-in from people at all levels and all backgrounds, not just the decision makers? That shows respect for humanity when you include everybody. How about this? Uh, do you actively seek to eliminate policies that erode trust? How about this? Or overcharging a captive audience. Have you ever paid $7 for a bottle of water at a baseball game or at a theme park? You're being taken advantage of when that happens. That is not respect for humanity. Or if there's subscription cancellation friction within your products or services, um, that does not make it easy or, or build trust with your customers uh, when it comes to them you know, operating that transaction with you. Hidden fees or selling sensitive data without them knowing about this. This does not show respect for your customers. Um, how about building products in a way that does not increase burden for other teams or tech debt? You know, sometimes we can hide hidden gotchas in products that we build and not really build that long-term trust when we work with, when we engage with other teams. And also, uh, how about building products that do not harm the environment? So, you know, these are all different ways that we show respect for humanity when we're building our products and solutions. Next is customer first. The business exists, exists to serve customers by creating products that are valuable and enrich their lives seeking out their experiences and incorporating their feedback into products. So one of the, one of the common tools in Lean is the voice of the customer, um, actively studying and surveying your customers and, and listening to their experiences to try to improve the products. It's a practical application for product managers. managers. Who is my customer? Um, externally, obviously, it's the person paying for the product. But what about your internal customer? Your internal customer is anyone who depends on you. And in Amazon, we have a philosophy or a leadership principle, principle called customer obsession. So it says leaders start with the customer and work backwards. And we have a, a technical tool called the PRFAQ document. So have you ever considered yourself to be customer obsessed about your internal customer, about giving them everything that they need to be successful? And then the next philosophy is continuous improvement. Businesses should seek continuous improvement out of respect for humanity and to serve their customers better. So you can see that these philosophies are working in concert together. Improvements should be executed continuously, but aligned with your long-term ideal state, having vision for the future. Lexus has a slogan called, that says, the relentless pursuit of perfection. Basically, Toyota as a company is being very overt about this value when they, when they have this slogan. They're telling you that they're seeking as a philosophy to continuously pursue improvement and perfection in their products. And at Toyota, they have a saying that says, it's the process is never best, only better. That's a mindset and a way of thinking in your business. The next is Genba first. And Genba is a Japanese word that means the place of work. And so within, within a manufacturing environment or any environment where you're creating something, um, Toyota would say that the greatest value is being performed at the job site by the person who's doing the work and not by people who are thinking and strategizing in the ivory tower or in the corporate headquarters. What you want when you're, um, when you're creating your, your lean system is to say, it, what they're saying here is that they value the place of work more than anything else. So practical application, requirements gathering should start with a deep understanding of the current state of the process and the problems. And we'll go into a little bit later about ways to do that. You show respect for humanity when you connect with the users of your products in person. And what, there's a, a principle within Toyota they call Genshi Genbutsu, where it's go look, go see. And they, they prioritize that. They want you to go and visit the place where you're going to help provide solutions to. You want to see the person doing their work. If possible, you want to do the work yourself so you can experience what they're going through. 
And then in my Toyota days, uh, my Korean friends used to call this kimchi genbutsu, where they would say, go look and go eat, which means when you go and you, you do your genchi genbutsu and you meet with your customer, uh, you go take them out to lunch and you have candid conversations with them and you build relationships so that you can more fully understand their conditions and build better products that meet their needs. So we talked about the first layer, which is the ph philosophical uh, inputs and drivers of why we do lean. The next philosophical layer is stability. And, and it's got this long bar that goes across the, the whole bottom. And the reason is because stability is the great enabler for, um, for lean. Without stability, you cannot do anything. And so um, when the environment is unstable, you see conditions like constant escalation, low morale and high attrition, rampant waste, poor quality, long lead times, high cost, poor customer experience, ineffective process improvement. And a lot of times when companies are trying to implement lean and they're focusing on the tools and methods and outcomes first, um, they, they, they do so without a, a stability strategy. And what, what I'll see a lot is they'll try to implement JIT because if I do JIT, then I will reduce my inventory levels and my costs will go down and everything will be better. But what ends up happening is that they, they get so lean that they actually hurt themselves. And it's because they didn't think about stability. And at, at Toyota and any effective lean leader, what they will actually do is they will add waste into their process to improve stability over going lean and, and implementing JIT. So if, if we look, if we recall on the previous slide, I'll go back up here. Stability is a philosophical layer and then the methods and tools like just in time reside far above that. You must have stability first before you can do anything else. So a way to think about this is this a classic uh, example here, which is uh, you have a boat that's on water and it's being, um, the boat is being guided by a, a captain and you are that captain you, as the product manager and the boat is the business and what you're, what you're riding on on the water is actually your ca capacity supply level. This could be personnel, this could be compute capacity, this could be inventory on the shelf. Um, that wh whatever you have in order to meet your customer demand is basically what that capacity is. It could be lead time as well. So you have capacity and then there's rocks uh, underneath all of that water. And thank God you have water because uh, you're able to glide across that water and, and sustain your business. But your water level is kind of high. You have, you have a little bit of excess here. So the question is how low can you go before you crash into the rock? And so you got to first understand what are my rocks? And some of the rocks can be the, the highest one here is high demand variance. If I have a demand variance from my customer that I don't understand, I cannot predict, then this is a, this is a big problem for me. And if, I, and if I reduce my capacity to meet my customer needs below the demand variance, then I could run into that rock. Or my, maybe my supplier doesn't deliver to me on time every time or with high quality. And so I have variable lead times. Or maybe I don't standardize my work. And so every time somebody does a project or does a, a repeatable process, it's not, um, it's not standardized and we have low quality. Or maybe I have high attrition or turnover. So in lean, what, what's attractive in industry is, well, I want to reduce my water level, my capacity, my supply level. So I'm running lean and I have less capital tied up or less money tied up in, in, in supporting all of this excess waste. Well, great. But if you do not address the rocks first, if you do not have a strategy for stability to, to address those problems, you can reduce your water level so much that you can crash your boat and crash your business. And so uh, what we want to do in lean, what we always want to do is we want to stabilize process, identify the rocks, remove them, and slowly lower the water level with caution. And in my experience at Toyota, there's no manager that ever recklessly tried to reduce inventory or reduce capacity in a way that was reckless. They always had a stability strategy so that they did not impact the business. So um, these mechanisms, the stability philosophy, once you have that, you're now able to engage in effective standardized work, effective Kaizen, um, Heijinka, which is level loading, you're able to do just in time in Jadoka, which will ultimately allow you to get to the highest quality, lowest cost and shortest lead time. So what are some lean methods and tools? Well, how do we get stability, execute philosophies and achieve outcomes? So these are the methods and tools that are going to put all of our philosophies into action. 
Hey, Junko, I mentioned this before, level loading production to, renew, to reduce noise of demand variation. The goal of a lean environment is to have every day look exactly the same as the previous day. If you're doing lots of overtime, if you're doing um, lots of escalations, that means that you have an unplanned outcome in your environment and you do not want that. You want stability in your environment. And hey, Junka is a mechanism to achieve stability. It actually adds waste into the process, but it's in a, Toyota would say this is a good waste to add to this process, it, process if, it, if it produces stability overall. This is not a commonly understood principle, and this is a key enabler to do anything with just-in-time inventory management. Standardized work. So when we standardize processes, we are able to make them repeatable and predictable. So we use standard operating procedures. We create process flows to understand what's happening. We use 5S, which is a, a, a maintenance activity to maintain the work environment to keep it clean and orderly. Kaizen, we conduct Kaizen processes continuously all the time. We're always looking for ways to improve and we identify waste and things that can be improved by using uh, this acronym, downtime, which is, it, it, it identifies eight ways. Uh, it's made of a defect, defects, overproduction, waiting, non-utilization of talent, excess transportation, inventory, motion, extra processing. And then root cause analysis, five whys. Uh, whenever you have a defect that occurs, ask why five times or more times to understand why is this happening to solve that problem and prevent it from reoccurring. And then value stream mapping, and I'll go into this in a minute, uh, which gives you a great mechanism to identify, to map your process and identify all the pockets where waste exists. And then just in time, which deals with customer driven demand driving your supply chain end to end. So this involves concepts like Kanban, pool systems, tack time, one piece flow, milk runs, small lot high frequency. And there's so much in here in each one of these that you could go into and dive deep into and extrapolate, which we don't have time here to do today. But um, I just want to give you some flavor for the context of these and how they fit into the overall architecture of the, of the house of TPS. And then Jadoka, which is building quality inspection into the process, making sure that no, uh, no defect passes along to the next process in the line. Um, there's ways to, to enable that through end on cord, pokayoki, and also Jodoka is concerned about worker safety. And so these methods and tools reinforce each other and they enable us to implement our philosophies. But uh, I will note that some tools do not readily translate to non-manufacturing business situations like milk runs, which is a logistics function, though there could be cases where if you got creative, you could implement a milk run in an office environment. Um, I think folks at Toyota would be the first to tell you that, yeah, you know, you're not always able to implement these in every situation, but if you get creative about it and you think, you think about it enough, you'll find where these principles apply. So I want to get into the Kaizen process. And I, and I took this screenshot from actually something I saw on LinkedIn from um, Jeffrey Liker and uh, you know, his book of, of the Toyota Kata, it talks about how we think about um, continuous improvement and, and what are we doing with Kaizen. And so um, the first step is you wanna identify your ideal long-term state. So you can see in, in the circle one uh, up at the top right there of the diagram, you'll see, um, yeah, here's my mouse here. You'll see, this is ultimately, where do I wanna go? That's the mountain I wanna climb. But I have this road from between me and, and where I want to be. And there's all kinds of pitfalls, uh, road blockages, all kinds of things in the way. So how do I get from where I'm at today to my ultimate destination? Well, you must deeply understand where you are today. And you must understand those roadblocks that exist in the way. And you know, this is part and parcel of the process of creating a roadmap. And so we'll, we'll talk later about deeply understanding this through a value stream map process. Uh, we create a smart goal. A, to create a target condition of where can I go in the short term right now to make incremental improvement along the way. And you'll see that on the, on the right here with the target condition. And then we do plan, do, check, adjust, which is this process where uh, we create the plan to meet the SMART goal. How am I going to get there? We do the plan and then we check our performance to see, okay, how is this going? And we, as we're continuously checking that performance, we do adjustments. And then we just repeat this process over and over and over again until we climb that mountain and get to where we ultimately want to be, recognizing that we can never truly get to the state of perfection. There's no, no best, only better. But we're always continuously driving to something better. So 
now, now I'm going to start talking about the value stream mapping. And within the context of Lean, we have this concept of, 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 of flow. And you've probably heard that it's like a buzzword within Lean. And what's, what this represents is, is, is a good way to think about this is, is if you go to a theme park. So in a theme park environment, um, like if I'm, if I'm taking my family to the theme park, I got to drive to the theme park with them. Uh, and then we get out of the car and then we, we walk and we go and we buy our tickets. We get in line to buy our tickets. And then when we get out of that line, then we go through a line of security. We get out of that line, we go into the line to get into the park. Then once we get into the park, we think about where we want to go. And then we walk maybe a quarter mile to half a mile to the next ride where we can get onto it. And then we, we, we get in line at that ride and it takes us 30, 45 minutes to get maybe an hour to get through that line. And then we get on the ride and the ride, we go for one to three minutes. And it's great. It's fantastic. We love it. We get off and we do it all over again. We walk another quarter mile, half mile to the next ride. We get in a line, we wait for an hour, and then we go on that ride and we, we ride for another couple minutes. So what I'm paying for as a customer is that period of time when I'm on the ride. That's what I'm most excited about. Maybe, maybe it's nice to see the gardening around the park and everything and just to be there in the environment. But I'm definitely not paying to be in line. I don't want to be in line. It's, it's, it's a waste of my day. It's a waste of everybody else's day. It's a hassle. Um, so that's an, a flow interrupter. It, ideally, what I want is to be on a ride back to back to back to back throughout the whole day. That, that would be awesome. If I didn't have to wait in any lines all day long, that would be my perfect, a perfect theme park experience. Um, but obviously, that's just not how theme parks operate. But that would be a flow state where I'm going back to back to back to back on every single ride. Anything interrupting that flow is a waste. So in a value stream map, this is something that helps you to identify um, those kinds of situations in a business context. And you can do a value stream map for any kind of business process, whether it's operating a manufacturing facility, a distribution center, or in this case, um, executing a marketing campaign uh, for your business. So what, the way it works is you start up in the top right, and this is your customer, and your customer is, is initiating some kind of request. And they say, I want to do this campaign. Great. They submit some a campaign request to the system in this fictitious business, business environment. And then this procurement department says, okay, great. I'm going to initiate a, re a request for quotes, RFQs, to several vendors that I know about. Great. And these are studio vendors, and they're going to help create this marketing campaign, but they're going to submit bids for, for that job. And so these vendors, they're going to they're gonna send their responses back, and, and they're going to send them to this uh, procurement administrator, maybe a, um, a secretary person, and th that person is going to receive maybe uh, letters in the mail or emails or whatever. And their job, what they're supposed to do is receive that information, scan it, uh, digitize it, and then pass it along to the procurement intern who's going, who's going to do a check. Now, this procurement administrator who, who does this process, she's a shared, this person is a shared resource, um, and they do multiple functions. So they're, they're, this is not their sole function. And because of that, when the vendor sends the information, this information sits in their inbox for, in this case, it looks like up to 12 and a half days. It'll just sit in their inbox waiting for them to take action. Okay, great. So it sits there for a while. And then when they finally take action, it takes them about a half an hour to do the actual work. And then they kick it over to the next person and say, all right, now it's in your queue. Great. So it's for the procurement intern, he's also a shared resource. He's, you know, he's, he's doing his function and uh, he'll get to it when he gets to it. And apparently it takes him four days to get to each one of these things. And when he does it, it takes him an hour to actually check each RFQ and process it. And then they're going to do a digital upload to the system. So they're going to upload this file into the system. And then um, and because this person is an intern, they actually have 20% defects when they do their job. Uh, they're still learning. And so there's, there's, there's a redo effort here that, that causes churn in this environment. Okay, so once he's, once he's done, he kicks it over, and, um, and then it goes to the procurement analyst. And this person's got more experience, and they're going to look at, at this work, and uh, they've got other things going on. It sits in their queue for seven days in their inbox. And, um, and then they, all right, they say, all right, I'm going to start doing my work. They download these RFQs. They analyze the RFQs. It takes them an hour for each RFQ that they look at. And then they, uh, if, if they have an exception, where they say, wow, this RFP came back and it's worth a million, you know, they want more than a million dollars, they'll send it over to finance and then finance will, will say, yes, I grant this exception or I don't. It takes finance a couple hours to do it. It's in their queue for a couple of days. 
Um, and then ultimately, it'll both of these. If there's not an exception, it'll it'll go to the procurement supervisor, and then they'll they'll initiate a batch process where they where they do all of their work, and it, it takes them four hours every time they they compile all these RFQs and, and to make a decision, and then it, they they send this package back to the marketing department. So wow, there's a lot going on. That is not uncommon in any work environment. You could, you'll see this happen everywhere. Shared resources, not working in concert together, uh, actually leads to an outcome where if you count up all the days and, and the individual lead times here, end to end, the process takes, they go take each, each RFQ 26 days to go through the pipeline. Okay. And the actual time where people are, are physically working on this product, adding value to it, is six and a half days of time. And even that's questionable. Like, why does it take the procurement supervisor four hours to do their function, right? So, and then, so when you think about the ratio of the flow ratio of the value add versus the waiting, you have a 3.1% amount of time where you're adding value in this process. And everything else, the 97% is really just waiting around for somebody to get around to it. So if you're wondering why the marketing, if the marketing department is wondering, why can't we you know, respond to our customer demand faster? Why can't we launch campaigns faster? This is why. So you know, some things to think about. When, when, we, when we start thinking about the current state of the process, we're going to map downtime to each of these buckets here and understand where, where is their waste and defects. We have a low value added ratio, high cycle time on creating the proposal. You know, one of the things, one of the uh, tools of lean is tack time and, and the line balance. How fast should each of these processes be taking? That's a calculation you can run in lean to know that your line is balanced so that everybody is working in concert with each other. Another thing you can do is set up a, a workflow cycle where you say, uh, we're going to, on Mondays, we're going to, all of us are going to sit in a room and we're going to knock this process out. And so what it would do is it would take the lead time down from 26 days to seven days. Great. That, that's, a, that's a major transformation. So another thing is this is a push system, not a pull system. So the, the, you know, each person is just pushing the next phase of the information down to the next person, whether they're ready for it or not. And so what happens in that kind of environment is defects start to hide and you have batch processes piling up and lead time increases and, and it, it's just not a, a continuous flow of activity. Um, and then another thing to consider is how long does it take the vendor to come up with their RFQ? That's something to think about. Maybe you can partner with your vendor to help them improve their process and, and get quicker at that. Um, and then why are there defects at all? In, in a lean state, what we're shooting for is zero defects. So another thing to, for the procurement analyst to work with the procurement intern on is what are some common repeatable defects where we can come back and, and um, you know, reduce those with, with greater training. So if you're a product manager and you're engaging with some kind of system solution on top of this value stream, be mindful of what's going on end to end. It, if, you're, if your job is to maybe try to automate the create proposal process, great, but be mindful that you know, there are, se there are several other processes going on here end to end that are also impacting this process uh, for better or for worse. And so before you myopic myopically focus on improving this one process, keep in mind that there's an entire system that needs to be analyzed and, and understood to know where the full value is end to end. So in summary, a lean product will seek to deliver customer value through lowest cost, highest quality and shortest lead time, all while upholding the foundational philosophies. PMs can use this framework to deeply understand their customers' problems, create vision for how their products should serve, and project manage to deliver the right outcomes. And this is a, a quote that inspired me from Henry Ford, and I think it underpins why we do lean. And he said in 1922, old time business went on the doctrine that prices should always be kept up to the highest point at which people will buy. Really modern business in 1922 has to take the opposite view. I do not believe that we should make such an awful profit on our cars. A reasonable profit is right, but not too much. So it has been my policy to force the price of the car down as fast as production would permit and give the benefits to users and laborers with resultingly, with resulting surprisingly enormous benefits to ourselves. So that comes from his book, My Life and Work. This is a quote that has inspired me and I hope it inspires you too. I think that if we think of business as an opportunity to serve other people, we can really produce transformative results for the business, our customers, and society. And I wish you best of luck on your lean journey. Thank you.